right, so in the previous video, we talked about some background information on Kant and introductory concepts for understanding Kant's larger ethical framework of the categorical imperative, which we're going to talk about right now. So as you know, Kant was really focused upon the intentionality of our actions, why we do what we do, and if we do something for the sake of duty, this moral obligation, then we are doing the right action. Then we are not just randomly doing the right thing, but we are doing it for the right reason. So the intention behind an action is what gives it moral worth rather than just the consequences that occur. In order to fully understand what gives an action moral worth, we have to really delve into the categorical imperative. And so the categorical imperative has two versions. The first one is universality. So let's first think about what a categorical imperative is, right? As it's stated here, it's objectively, it's an objectively necessary universal principle. It's absolute. It must be done consistently. It must be done all the time, regardless of culture, time, context, or the individual, right? It is not relative. Just by definition of something being imperative, that means it's a command. So the categorical imperative, the first version, is universality. And as Kant states here, I am never to act otherwise than so that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law. All right, what does that mean? We should never act in a way where we don't want other people to act in that way. We should never act in a way where we don't want to be living in a society where people are acting that same way. So oftentimes, we as human beings do things that violate this all the time. We make exceptions for ourselves. We think, oh, well, it's okay for me to do this one time, or it's okay for me to do this a few times, but not to, not to think that everyone else can do it. We can lie sometimes. Sometimes people cheat and steal and plagiarize and kill people, right? Those actions violate universality because we don't want to be living in a world where everyone is killing each other. We'll never feel safe. We don't want to live in a world where everyone is lying because we can never trust one another, right? That would be really sad if we can never trust other human beings. So actions that violate universality tend to be bad actions because we don't want to be living in a world where everyone is doing that all the time. So you as a moral agent, you as a moral actor, should always ask yourself, do I will this action to become a universal principle? And if you say no, then you probably should not be doing it. If you say yes, then you're probably doing the right thing. But oftentimes, it's a helpful test to try to understand whether we're doing the right thing. So sometimes we might think, oh, if I just lie to this person because it'll make them feel better, then it's okay. But do we want to live in a society where everyone is lying all the time? No, because then we never really would know the truth. We never know what's accurate, what's correct. So this is the first version of the categorical imperative, the universality. Act only on that maxim whereby thou canst at the same time will that it should become a universal law. So we should always be acting in a way where we would will our actions to become a universal law. The categorical imperative is something that is intrinsically good. It is good in itself. It is not good for the sake of something else. It, is, it does not have instrumental value. And the categorical imperative, just by definition of being a categorical imperative, differs from a hypothetical imperative. So a hypothetical imperative, it's kind of tangential to Kant's main theory, but I think it's worth noting that a hypothetical imperative is not something that must be done all the time universally. It conveys that an action can be done within a certain context or within a certain situation as a means to something else, as a means to something else that you will or desire. So for example, you as a student have to study a specific discipline a lot in order to achieve that degree or in order to become proficient in that career. Do you want to live in a society where everyone is studying physics all the time? No. Right? We need to be able to specialize in different tasks in order to contribute different things to the society. So it's only imperative for you to do that or for you to study this in this specific situation. Or let's say you have a vitamin C deficiency, right? And you need to drink orange juice and eat oranges. oranges. Um, do you want to live in a society where everyone is only eating oranges or eating a lot of oranges and drinking a lot of orange juice all the time? Well, that's not going to work for everyone. 
right? Because we all have different bodies, we all have different needs, we all have different health um, criteria. So a hypothetical imperative is only something that is important or valuable within that context to something else that's achieved. It is not a command. It's not something that should be done all the time. So this is Kant's first version of his categorical imperative. The second version of the categorical imperative is a categorical imperative of humanity. So let's look at this quote right here. Rational nature exists as an end in itself. What does that mean? Well, we as human beings have a rational nature. We belong to the category of persons. What makes us valuable as persons is not our human DNA, it's not our ability to feel compassion, it's our rational ability that makes us valuable. So as human beings, we should always be treating one another with respect as inherently valuable. We should never solely use one another as a means to an end. Right? We should never use one another. We should never violate one another's autonomy and rationality. And so, unfortunately, oftentimes we do do that as human beings. We do violate the categorical imperative of humanity by killing one another, by lying, by stealing, by cheating. Uh, all of these terrible things also violate the second version of the categorical imperative because we are constantly violating our rational nature. We are violating our dignity and autonomy. Right? By killing someone, you are not allowing that person to stay alive. You're not allowing that person to decide for themselves whether they are going to stay alive or not. Rape is another example of an action that violates the categorical imperative because you are using someone's body as a means to an end without them consenting. An interesting one is that suicide violates the categorical imperative of humanity. How would suicide violate the categorical imperative of humanity? Well, you're not allowing yourself to reach your potential. You're not allowing your future self to have a say in your life, right? So we can also violate the categorical imperative of humanity when it comes to ourselves, right? We do that all, all the time to ourselves, unfortunately, where we use ourselves or we don't really allow ourselves to really flourish as human beings. So think about actions that happen on a daily level that violate the categorical imperative of humanity, right? What makes them wrong is that they violate our human nature. They violate our free will and our consent. So we as human beings should not only strive to avoid violating the categorical imperative, we should also strive to have our actions harmonize with humanity. We should strive to have our actions allow people to exist in a way where they're making choices, where they're achieving a autonomy of the will, where they are rational actors, where they are moral agents. Right? So we should engage in actions that are benevolent towards humanity, that help people, that treat people right, as valuable ends, as inherently valuable beings. So things like volunteering or teaching or helping or charity, right? these are all things that fulfill the categorical imperative of humanity. They can also fulfill the first version of the categorical imperative being universality, right? Do we want to live in a society where everyone is helping one another, where everyone is donating money or where everyone is volunteering their time, right? I think we would want to. So we as human beings are striving to achieve this autonomy of the will. And autonomy of the will means that our will, our volition is free from our inclinations. It's free from our instincts. We're not controlled by our emotions. We're not slaves to our emotions. We have our reason that is dictating our actions and that leads us to do the right thing. So autonomy of the will is basically our will being liberated from our emotions. We are free from the, the dominance of our emotions. And how do we achieve autonomy of the will? We act for the sake of duty, right? Duty is something that is a moral obligation that affects everyone to the same degrees. It's a practical constraint upon our life. We all act for the sake of duty all the time, right? As students, you may not feel like writing a paper, but you do it for the sake of duty. Or when you go to work, you may not feel like going to work every day, but you do it for the sake of duty. Or if you are a parent or a caretaker of some sort, you may not feel like cooking for your child all the time or taking your child to soccer practice or piano, piano lessons, but you do it because you know it's the right thing to do. If we just did what we felt like doing, we would be perhaps lazy. We wouldn't be contributing to society in the way we should be contributing to society. So we should always strive 
to have our actions be done for the sake of duty, right? We are universal beings. So our actions are always inherently impacting one another, right? So we need to always think about how our actions impact one another when we're making a moral decision. Now, everything that we're talking about with the categorical imperative, both versions, do not apply to entities and beings that are classified as things. What are things? Things are beings whose existence does not depend upon a rational will. Their existence depends upon nature, right? Their actions are dependent upon inclinations and instincts rather than a sense of duty. They don't have the ability for, from Kant's perspective to act for the sake of the moral law, right? So this means that things only have relative value. Their value is relative to us as human beings. So a dog's value, for example, would be relative to our value as human beings. The environment, the Earth's value, is only relative to how we feel about it as human beings. So let's say you are walking your dog, it's a beautiful day outside, you and your dog are having a great time, then someone just, you know, from out of the blue comes and kicks your dog. Would that actually be morally right or morally wrong for Kant? Well, it depends upon how that person kicking your dog impacts you as a rational person. Let's say that person kicking your dog makes you feel sad and it makes you cry, it makes you feel really angry, then that action is wrong from a Kantian perspective. But let's say that person kicking your dog does not have an impact upon you, it doesn't, you don't really feel anything, and that's completely fine from Kant's perspective. So things only have relative value, they only have a value that's dependent upon how they impact us as human beings, as persons. So the categorical imperative of universality and of humanity do not apply to things. We can use things because they do not have a special rational nature. So in this video, just to kind of summarize what we talked about, we discussed the categorical imperative, both versions of universality, willing that your action becomes a universal principle, and then the second version, the categorical imperative of humanity, never using another human being as solely as a means to an end. And then the different versions or the different categories of existence, right? Being persons and things. And that we all as human beings are striving to achieve autonomy of the will and must act for the sake of duty. So that is all I have for today. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions.